Hi, I'm Thorsten, Thorsten Krinning. I'm your co-host today and publisher of spacewatch.global and we are a Europe-based online platform for information in and about space and new space activities in a geopolitical context. I would like to thank all our private and corporate supporters that showed their commitment to keeping our independent journalism alive. We really appreciate that. I know many of you are already familiar with our website, our bi-weekly and daily newsletters and the Space Cafe podcast. So, and our bi-weekly newsletter you might have had in your mailbox earlier today. Um, so about the podcast, the last one features Anne Ansland of Thrust Me about her vision of our future in space. We also have new exciting episodes in the Space Cafe radio. One of them is with Jim Bridenstein. I had the chance to speak in Lausanne and more to come. We also keep our fan shop open online for you where you can support us actively and become a real space watcher. If you have missed any of our previous web talks, we have an archive available on our webpage in the event section and on YouTube. We will host our Space Cafe Law Breakfast with Stephen Freeland live on a bi-monthly base. And it's the ninth edition today already, so you know that we keep what we said. So with that, I'm handing over to your host today in... Did you, did you wrote rainy Sydney? Sunny <laughs> Sydney today, so sunny Sydney. So Professor Stephen Freeland, Stephen, the floor is yours. Oh, thanks, Torsten. Hi, everyone. Uh, yes, it's um, uh, luckily it's sunny at the moment. We've had uh, incredible amounts of rain in Sydney, but um, thankfully we've had a big bit of weather. But look where we are now, and we'll hear in a minute. Um, welcome to our ninth uh, edition of the Law Breakfast. And uh, today we've got to talk about some really, really uh, fundamental issues about the peaceful uses of space. I'll come to that in a minute. Um, you know about our program, I don't need to tell you. Um, we always have the most incredible people talking about how the law, how policy, how space is so relevant for our lives and relevant for current events. Um, and uh, we've just got the most amazing people today, Ranjana, Carl and Kayub Shriver, dear friends of mine. I'll introduce them in a minute. Um, but first, as I said, uh, this is a very special breakfast because normally we're in a cafe, but we're somewhere slightly different today. We're having a space cafe breakfast picnic. Um, Ranjana, where are we and why are we here? Well, we're here because uh, I've invited you and thank you for accepting my invitation. <laughs> and we are here at India Gate, which is, um, this is the capital city of India. You all know Delhi. Um, for me, uh, I've chosen this place as my favorite because this is part of my growing up, this entire, uh, this monument. And as you are seeing in front of you, you have the India Gate behind you. This, what is the equivalent of the National Mall for us? And the lawns around it and that marvelous, wonderful domed shaped building on the top of the hill, which is the residence of the president of India. But the relevance of this whole situation, other than my own uh, sort of uh, link to it, is that this is the capital. It was built uh, as the capital for uh, to represent the crown of England as the paramount power after the East India Company was sort of exited, so to speak. And they shifted capital to Delhi, and now they wanted to build a new capital. Why Delhi? because it has been an ancient capital over generations of empires. It's been broken and built eight <laughs> times. Mars happens to be the last eight in the series, if you like. But when you, the relevance of this, you stand, you're now standing on the dome with me, on that hill. That was the Viceregal Lodge, which is where the Viceroy of India, uh, representing the Crown of England, lived from 1935 to 1947. And when you look in front of you, you're looking at these lawns that you're looking at now as you're, uh, you know, looking with the India Gate behind. you. But if there was no India Gate, then that's a war memorial for the First World War and subsequently the others. But without that, what, so Malcolm Haley, whose job in life was to find the right spot for the new capital on top of that hill on horseback is looking in front at the river, which is flowing at the back. And on the right, if you turn around and have a look, you will see the ramparts of an old fort. It's a 16th century fort built on very ancient 
by ancient in Indian terms, I'm talking a couple of thousand years, ancient. And when you look to the right, there weren't all these tree-lined avenues then. You're looking at the Red Fort, which is a 17th century new capital, which was built by this Mughal emperor called Shah Jahan, called Shah Jahan the Magnificent, who built the Taj Mahal for his wife. And that's his greatness. That's how much he loved his 14th wife, as it happened. And he uh, was in the fort, at the Agra fort, and spent his last days looking. And the, the emperor and empress both buried over there. And so now this, these two big cities, which were on near the river, and now here is Malcolm Haley on top of that hill and said, okay, now this is the spot which gives the optics of the successor in power in India. And that is how Delhi came to be built. For me, like I said, it's part of growing up. And this lawn this, that you see on the right-hand side, the third, is where we call back lawns. We used to call that back lawn because the home and school were uh, you know, on the other side. And there, uh, one fine morning, I recall in school, November, I think, of 61, and when we reached school, we were shown this black and white photograph that had appeared in the newspaper that day with this dog like us seated, what seemed like a cockpit, and alongside this gentleman with a helmet. And we were told that they're coming. They're coming and we are giving you holiday until lunchtime. Off you go to the back lots and wave to them and say hello. So off we ran to this, printed across to this road that is in front of you. And after, after a while came this first limo open air got going so slowly to enable Gagarin to actually stand. And he was not wearing a helmet, he was wearing a suit, I recall, the same color as the brick uh, of, the, of, the, of the India gate at the back, as I recall. And he was waving and smiling, and we were the only kids over there as it happened um, and at us. And then we were standing to see his car, but then he was alone with one more person. And then the next, and that he was going so slowly, we could read that number plate, Yuri 1. And then we said, okay, now Laika is in the car in the back. And then came Yuri 2, no Laika. And by then he had gone. We never got a chance to ask him whether he'd drop her off for a while with us. So that's Delhi for me. And as it turns out, I have lived always within one and a half kilometers of this monument on this side or that side. I don't know how it has happened, but it has happened that way. I think, Stephen, have you come to my house? Yes. What? yes. No, that's Haley Road. Ah, Maybe. okay, okay. Uh. So all of you, Kaiwi, Torstein, Kara, give me a heads up, come to Haley Road when you're in Delhi or planning to. Give me a heads up. So oh. thank you for being here with me today. Oh, thank you so much. What a beautiful story. and and. The idea of uh, Yuri Gagarin and, and Laika just going down uh, just where we're standing now is uh, is quite extraordinary. Thank you, thank you for inviting us, and it's just wonderful to be here. Thank you. And the and the weather is not too bad. The weather is not. Too um, bad. The weather is not too bad today. It's come down on a two degrees. I think it's forty degrees today. It's okay. feeling tropical. <laughs> it is. <laughs> In comparison. Um, thank you, thank you, Ranjana. Um, uh, and 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 it's it's wonderful to be in such a wonderful country, talking about um, essential elements of life and humanity because India has such, as you pointed out, such an incredible history. So today with uh, Ranjana and Kayuva, we're going to talk really about the fundamentals of space, and the fundamentals of space and how we use space revolve around peaceful uses of space and about around cooperation we spoke about cooperation last time with uh, olavo and um, and Ungard. and and we're going to talk about you know in these incredibly difficult times that we're in um what we must do how we must preserve these notions of peaceful use and and uh, and and avoid all of the the tensions that are building up that seem to be taking us in some directions that we don't want to go. So let me briefly introduce uh, Ranjana, who you've already heard from, and Kaiva. Ranjana Carl, welcome again from uh, Dwar Associates in New Delhi, which is a, a law firm 
that uh, advises uh, and has a space advisory practice uh, on international law, advises startups, advises on national regulations, advises corporates. And Ranjana is a director of the International Institute of Space Law, like myself and LBC Kayuva, uh, and a co-founder of what's called Spaceport Sarabhai S2, which is a, a not-for-profit independent think tank on space matters. And, is involved in advising uh, the Indian Space Promotion and Authorization Center in space uh, on areas about reform, about new space, about policy. And India is such an important country in the space ecosystem. And Ranjana, welcome. You do such a wonderful job there. And then my dear friend also, Kayuva, who's been an inspiration to me, really a mentor to me for so long, uh, Kayuva Shrogal. He's the president of the International Institute of Space Law. I'm, I'm honored to be on the board under his presidency. Um, he's, his CV is so long, but just uh, some highlights. From 2014 to 2016, he was the chair of legal subcommittee of COPWAS. And together with a number of really distinguished authors, he's the co-editor of a two-volume handbook on space security. He works for ESA European Space Agency as Special Advisor for Political Affairs. Um, welcome to you, Kaiva, as well. It's, it's so lovely to have you both here. Um, before we go into the meat of it, obviously we need to hear your one word about space, our tradition. And we've got so many people who have so said so many words, we're not, we're not gonna take you through all of them, but um, we know from what we've heard that space is such a rich um, concept and with different thoughts and means different things to different people. So Kayuva, welcome. Tell us, what is your word for space and why? Yeah, thank you, uh, Stephen. Thank you very much for, for having me in, in this wonderful edition of, of uh, Space Cafe together uh, with Ranjana and uh, our friends uh, from Spacewatch Global. Now, um, what, what comes to my mind is, 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 is the following. Uh, space law, uh, certainly not in, in, in your fantastic series of, of the Space Cafe for, for, for legal uh, issues, is blamed to be old, to be cumbersome, uh, it's attacked, uh, it's, it's bullied also, but, to the contrary, I would say, space law is inspiring. It at least inspires me and I hope it inspires uh, also generations of, of lawyers because, because it contains principles, principles which we rarely find in other fields of international law, like freedom uh, of, of, of use, free access, uh, non-appropriation, sharing of benefits. This is uh, something which is fantastic. Uh, we should keep it. We, we should cherish that. And, and this is the inspiring uh, aspect of it. Why should we defend space law instead of promoting the principles to be used and applied also in other fields of international law? Of course, this sounds a little bit naive, but well, we have to try. We are the ones, the space lawyers, who experience and know how inspiring these principles are and can be. And why shouldn't we also be the ones who are promoting their application in an inspiring way to activities on Earth? Well, just wonderful words. I completely agree with you. It, I was at a conference yesterday, Kaiva, where one of the speakers said, oh, you know, the, the treaties, the Outer Space Treaty, it really just doesn't work. It doesn't have the right words, you know, we need. And, and like you, I, I countered that by saying, you know, we should treasure these incredible principles we have. They mean so much. And, and it's just so easy to dismiss what is, has kept us going and meant that, you know, space has worked for so long. So, I completely agree. For me, it's inspiring. And thank you for sharing that. What about you, Ranjana? That's a tough act to follow. What do you think? Yeah, it's a tough act, but I'm glad he set the foundation for me. Um, for me, it's like outer space, actually. It's enduring. 
and space law has an enduring quality. It's an inspiring quality, as Kai we just said, and that inspiring quality is an enduring quality, and that's its core strength. That these seventy years we have had peaceful space, peacefully countries have explored and they use, irrespective of whether they're space, space bars or not. That may be the unintended consequence of what was the intention of the two sort of inimical states, uh, eyeball to eyeball contest situation. But they had the leadership, maybe not to think of it in this inspiring, enduring way, but certainly they wanted enduring in context to non-appropriation, space including the moon and the celestial bodies, and the freedom to explore and to use. And even today we find whatever are the new proposals that are coming up as technology changes, as uh, space to earth uh, economy saturates, they still want the proposals to be somehow linked into the outer space treaty. Now, why would that be? If the terms are not right, if it is so archaic and it's so old, I think it's futuristic as a matter of fact. I think enduring is right and and long may it be as well because uh you know we need you know space is there for humanity in the past in the present but moving into the future and we really need to think of it in that way and and reflect that so thank you for sharing so let's move into really difficult times and difficult discussions we're all aware of the circumstances that we find ourselves in we have the scourge of war uh, at the moment with all of the horrors that we're seeing on our television screen every day um, we have geopolitical tensions we have disparities in wealth in power we have the development um, of military space technology in a way that seems unprecedented. Um, and space is regarded as this incredibly strategic area, ignoring perhaps some of the other more humanistic elements. So all of that, one might argue, is a, almost a perfect storm scenario for space. If ever we need to maintain and reiterate the peaceful purposes, the fundamental principles of space, I think this is the time. So Ranjana, really starting at the beginning, what are these fundamental ideas, these fundamental precepts of peaceful purposes in space? And how do you think our, our without going into the law in great detail, how do you think the treaty framework or the fundamental principles that Kaiva mentioned, help us to focus on the idea that space is there for peaceful use and peaceful exploration. So let me, um, as you suggested, and I entirely endorse, not go into the legalese chapter and verse, but let me build on the theme of inspiration and endurance of this document. It is an outstanding international treaty, frankly. So let's look at it in very simple language. Let's say that there are two load-bearing pillars. The one is the negotiated interpretation of peaceful use, that is to say, not military use. The other load-bearing is non-appropriation. Now, you will notice that there are these concepts that are familiar to the two opposite parties, and of course, all the newly independent sovereign states as they uh, started gaining independence from colonial rule, and those that may not have been. They all have one vote, they are all in the UN. Now these two inimical parties have the option of a bilateral treaty, fickle as they are by their very description, typically one, one might have advantage over the other, but certainly both have the uh, element of surprise in their favor, just to simply walk out and do what they want. So they choose the UN, they choose the UN, which is just newly formed itself. They set up the mechanisms for it, the COPOS and the USA. And they spent 10 years going word by word, phrase by phrase, article by article. So here are these two load bearing pillars and those are the two principal load bearing pillars. It supports a tabletop. That tabletop is an equal mix of freedom of use, exploration, and outer space to include moon and other celestial bodies. 
on that table top is an ornate tray on which there are a whole bunch of do it yourself kits inspiring <laughs> enduring do it by do it yourself kits which have all of these principles cooperation international peace uh, due care common interest irrespective of economic and uh, scientific development as most of our countries were at the time this is not a document only for the wealthy western powers that had been colonial rulers and masters this is also for the rest of the world which are not in that position many which are still not in that position you refer to that there's disparity of wealth there's disparity of development and growth and it's lasted this long but for me the willing proposition is in article 2 because both of them know that you know human minds ideas whatever it is it's fickle it can change look at the last five the phrase or by any other means that takes you straight away into eternity whatever it is that you're looking to do if even directly indirectly obliquely use whatever adjective it means appropriation it's not happening yeah it, it's really interesting because appropriation is now spoken about a lot the non appropriation in the context of just about space resources but you're absolutely right that that is the fundamental thing it was put in there right at the beginning it was agreed and it and it has helped to deflect any potential for conflict in space because you know everybody recognizes that this notion of territory the notion of trying to acquire i mean we're seeing it live out in in front of us on our television screens every day now these notions of of acquiring territory and resources lead to conflict and i completely agree i always say for me non appropriation is the fundamental notion that holds everything together so i love your idea of pillars and table top thank you for that and and you mention the institutions kayuva um you've been so closely involved and have shaped the way institutions in space work particularly in the coplas as i mentioned but we also have the conference of disarmament we have other areas do you think uh, and yet they sort of look at space in different ways one peaceful uses one perhaps in security related ways and do you think the fact that we have institutions that look at space in a dual use sort of way do you think that helps us promote this idea of peaceful uses or do you think it confuses things that that we have different institutions looking at space from a security perspective from a weapons perspective perhaps and how do we shape the institutions to 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 reflect the fundamental principles that you talk about you know you you've worked there what do you think is the best way forward for that <clears throat> it's it's a complex issue and uh the 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 question as you pose it uh demonstrates how how difficult it is to um respond in a, in a, in a in a simple and straightforward way uh the first issue i would like to raise is that um when 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 we talk and and i include myself and 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 many other people who even know and work in such institutions uh that we talk about the un corpus is not working the conference on disarmament is not working the united nations system is not working and this is completely unfair and does not uh contain the 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 real truth in it because it's the member states the member states who either make it work or make it fail so it's the member states their policies their goals be they open be they hidden who really are the ones which either want to find solutions common ground or at least approaches and management to conflict in a multilateral setting or they don't and we have seen that also in these uh, four are you you mentioned uh, as as a kind of uh, periods where there has been 
cooperation, where there has been confrontation, where things went apart, where things converged also. But it's always, and I stress that again, the will and the politics and the policies of the member states themselves who either make it uh, successful or make it fail. Now, we also have uh, at, at the, um, well, for the past 50 years, we have a parallel track in um, kind of non-multilateralism, but uh, that uh, a few countries uh, try to figure out and, and, and then also uh, to put together uh, rules or uh, at least uh, ways of approaching things uh, in, a, in a way uh, which might be effective in some specific uh, areas or fields, but which are lacking then the legitimacy, uh, which only can be provided by multilateral approaches. So this sounds all a little bit abstract, but, but it's uh, important to remind that uh, we have these fora. Um, we, we, we should not, uh, if there is now a phase uh, where we have no real orientation or where things don't really work, that it can be overcome with a change in the attitudes of the member states. And this is the, 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 the real issue, and possibly we will come to that uh, uh, later in, in our discussions. This is how we also have to influence the policies of the member states. It's not only uh, the abstract uh, way that the diplomats meet and uh, then we will see what is the outcome. No, it is that all of us and, and us as space lawyers in all these uh, countries and continents have to approach also the, um, the governments, our home governments, other governments, as well as legislatures, uh, in order to make them aware of where to go, what to do, and in particular also of the strength of space law and these principles uh, which are contained in space law. Yeah, I agree. You know, we've just had legal subcommittee, as you know, Kaiuva, and and consensus was achieved, e even in the most difficult times that that you know we I think have ever been experienced, and there were really difficult discussions because of what's going on uh, the the war in Ukraine at the moment, in particular, um, but also other issues, and so. Even those that criticise COPOS or criticise that part of the system, you know, I always challenge them, where else in the world will you get consensus at the moment, uh, given where we are? So part of it is a notion of, you know, space, we have more in common in space, and, and it's in everybody's interest to at least try to move forward in a rational way where, as you say, multilateralism will allow for rules of the road that everybody can contribute to and therefore, hopefully, um, lessen the, the, the possibility of misunderstandings. It's tough, but, you know, it, it sort of works sometimes. Ranjana, do you, do you see, what about the practice? You know, Kayuga is saying, that we need to ensure that member states understand these issues. What are you seeing, you know, in your country, but also in the work you're doing? Do you see the, that spacefaring nations, by and large, are, in a sense, putting as their priority these nationalistic, terrestrial tensions, the geopolitics, and translating that into non-cooperation? We're hearing, obviously, about lack of cooperation in space now as a result of what's going on? Or do you see actually flickers of hope in the way that member states are beginning to recognise that really we're in this together? I mean, where do you see the practice going? Look, as far as the practice is concerned, if you if I delink it from state practice in outer space, nobody is breaching it per se in the manner in which we expect that to happen. So everybody wants 
that freedom and so forth, so forth, to remain as it is in outer space to operate. How are they using that? As Kaibu was saying, at the end of the day, it's humans. That is the agency that will decide the success or the failure of institutions, multilateralism, whatever you like. And as you're saying, that is it a case that everybody's thinking for themselves in isolation, not realizing that actually we're all bound together in this enterprise called outer space? It is. It might well be. As far as space faring powers are concerned, um, I would not club all of them together because there are super space powers faring nations, and then there are space faring nations. So I will club the just space-faring nations with all the others who access, but may not have speech. Um, they may not be speech. The leadership is necessarily with the uber, super space paths. The two of the old days remain. There's a third which aspires to global leadership. Aspiration to global leadership is a natural, obvious expectation. I want to be the president of India, but that's great. I mean, that's... As far as you know, that's not the point. The point is that uh, am I going to do something to get there? Together, as I would here on the earth, I'll take my own decision, do my own thing, who's to ask me or speak to me. But are you distinguishing from outer space, which necessarily requires cooperation, coordination, sitting together? Where else would you get consensus, if not in the corpus? And I do believe that as as Kai we was saying, that it is for space lawyers, for think tanks, a number of our countries, they may be space pairing or not, but haven't really started thinking of it in this dimension because they're not calling the shots. And so they don't want to, uh, you know, uh, stay their steady course and get on with it and be, you know, law abiding if you like. But where you have superpower, then there is greater responsibility. And there is, I mean, they are the con two countries or now three countries that have given this structure. If they do, and their leadership do not and unable to recall their own contribution to where we are, this freedom, etc., where their leadership, the advisors of those leaders, the supporting staff of the leader, that entire ecosystem, we had the Bay of Pigs right in the middle of everything that was happening, but it's endured. They stayed the course. They got on with the whole job. It's not as if they've uh, become bosom buddies thereafter. They remain the way that they have been. And nobody is unrealistic. But the leadership in principle must come from the leaders. And for all other countries who exercise sovereign right to have their own, you know, in context of international sphere, their own policies, their whatever, approaches for each that, you know, the do-it-yourself kits, they're there for everybody to use. All have benefited of it. It is now give back time, if you like. And so you need to have also think tanks, etc., lawyers, putting it out for discussion. For it to be discussed, it has to be known. For it to be known, it has to be articulate. So maybe television interviews or maybe articles or whatever it is to create an awareness to promote that. I think everyone has to contribute, particularly all of us who are in the space uh, practitioners, so to speak. Mm -hmm. may, 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 Stephen, yeah. may, may I possibly react on, on what Ranya said? Of course. Because it was, course. it was absolutely excellent. I, I completely agree. And um, maybe we can, we can get uh, concrete uh, on the basis of, of what Ranjana said. First about leadership. Um, we, we should not be naive that uh, there are different types of space powers and spacefaring uh, nations and, and that uh, also the, the kind of initiating uh, then activities, projects and also regulatory approaches uh, certainly comes with also the substance of what these uh, uh, countries respectively are doing and uh, putting on the table. Now, for example, uh, in the field of uh, space debris mitigation, it was a small club uh, of, of the IADC, uh, uh, around 10 countries, which 
took the leadership uh, in order to come up with regulation, which, however, then, and that's, that's the most important thing, it should not simply be restricted to either one or two or a small club, which then was brought in the multilateral framework for a kind of, um, let's say, making it universal. And that, that worked, and, and it can work. We have another example right now. A few weeks ago, the US government um, promoted, uh, how should I put that, uh, 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 a stop of ASAT tests uh, or a moratorium. Uh, you can read it uh, as, 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 as you wish. This is a, 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 an excellent uh, initiative. It should have come um, half a year ago or at least uh, beginning this year because it would have been more effective um, in view of, of, of Russian participation uh, in that. But nevertheless, this is leadership in a positive way. It is regulation which is proposed and which also then can lead uh, to a point where a new universal uh, understanding of banning or at least giving a moratorium to anti-satellite tests is established. And this is also built, and, and, and there we come back to, to the issue of educating and promoting also. This is built on the work of think tanks and of individuals for many, many years, uh, right after the Chinese uh, test in particular, to come up with something like that for the purpose of space. And there, two things or two streams coincide. On the one hand, it's the leadership of one country or a small group of countries, which then has to be translated into a multilateral approach. On the other hand, it is something where the themes uh, of, uh, uh, in particular, peaceful purposes, as, as, as we uh, discuss it uh, today, can make uh, progress uh, in international fora also based on uh, work which has been done by civil society and NGOs. Just take, for example, uh, uh, an initiative like Stop Ecocide, uh, which tries to put in uh, ecocide uh, as uh, an element in the statutes uh, of the uh, International Criminal Court. Uh, it's it's bottom-up, it's civil society, and it's getting successful. Maybe we even need something as focused as Stop Ecocide also for space. And, and we are the ones, and, and, and Space Watch, I think, is, is uh, also a wonderful platform to promote uh, these issues. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I've been uh, arguing that we need to promote a peace race in space. Um, and uh, because I want, I want to ask both of you about, I mean, of course, we all agree that this is a fundamental issue. And yet the reality is what the reality is. Space is seen also as an important part of the military infrastructure or the military uh, elements of many, many countries. And every year since whenever, since 1980 or something, the United Nations General Assembly passes its omnibus resolution talking about the prevention of arms, of an arms race in space in the context of the fact that we're hearing more and more sadly about military uses of space. And, and the latest Paros declaration, and I'm just quoting now, said, it is the importance and urgency of preventing an arms race and calling on state, states to refrain from actions. But it having a focus on preventing the arms race still legitimizes, in my eyes, the idea that military uses of space are okay. And of course, they are practically where we are. But I just wonder, as you say, should there be a push? Can there be a push? from the space ecosystem from below to shake that around a bit, to try to change our thinking about space? Or are we so embedded in this idea that space is part of the military infrastructure that it's irreversible and that tendency will go on? 
albeit that we're trying to constrain the way it goes forward. Can you see a future of space taking away it, the emphasis on its military uses? And how does that sit with peaceful purposes? It's a difficult question. Ranjana, do you have a view on that? And Kaiza? Um, I'll, <laughs> it's a very, um, what can I say? Aspirational proposition that you have made. Um, and I don't know whether in my lifetime I will see such a change. But as we are seeing, uh, it is not a case that space is being used for military purpose in context to peaceful use. Space is being used as a force multiplier for terrestrial worlds. So, when we see this demonstration some 30 years ago for the first time on our television screens being played out and the magic and the power of that incredible force multiplier, every single country has now got space capability as part of its security architecture. So that is what brings us here because just about everyone is able to do this or the other, if not all. How do we move away from that? Now, I really have no idea of how, but I think if you had a catastrophic event in outer space, which is caused not by some military action, because that of course would be out of, uh, completely out of line there, but because of the overcrowding and the overcrowding which is unregulated because there is Corpus doesn't have consensus because, of course, you're going to keep yourself away. I mean, I'm a member, but really I have nothing to do with it. It's only the organization, that inanimate room, which is Corpus. So now you will put the shift the blame on something else because you are not able to do it yourself. So now the question is, if there's a catastrophic event, for whatever reason, whether there is a private space asset that is seen as being a legitimate target because it is contributing, then I would imagine that if that is indeed the case as has been reported in the recent few weeks, then the country which is the licensor should be asking that particular company that's looking at what are you doing? And if you, if you do any such, we will suspend your license. We don't know anything about that, but we do know of this amazing statement of no further ASATs that the country has taken that responsibility. But I would like to know what I advise private space companies. I want to know what is the obligation of the licensor. You can put down half a dozen different things, but this is important because it, we are seeing it playing out for the first time. Uh, how do we... What I'm saying is that when these things happen, then unless, again, there is a groundswell built up in all countries that are using space, not only space-faring nations. Of, 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 it takes time, but it so has to be done. Our economies will collapse if there's a catastrophic event of, you know, in low Earth orbit, knocking everybody out. But before that happens, I hope to God that it doesn't happen that a piece of falling debris hits an airliner, passenger airliner because that is an uncontrolled entry. India has had two events in the last two months where debris has fallen. One is north of Bombay, um, Mumbai, and one is to the west. Uh, the newspaper says that there has been no uh, damage to property and loss of life. Um, that's what the news reports. So just as well. But the point of the matter is this that space, you know, it's like getting up in the morning for about a week with a headache and you wonder that, no, 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 this is not usual, I need to call my doctor. This is that point of inflection for us to think very carefully. And I think that you have to articulate it in very simple language to everybody, including the decision maker. They're not space lawyers. For them, well, I switch on my TV, I'm looking at DCH and Bravo, great film on Netflix. But that's not the point. We have a very simple approach to how space is being used ordinarily. 
I was invited to a television interview once and said that, you know, but does does India need to go to the moon in the first place? And we have so much property with this and that and that. I said, you know, um, uh, yeah, I agree with you, but I'm glad that we did because I, you wouldn't have invited me here today. We, uh, <laughs> you know, so what I'm saying is that sometimes these arguments are so simplistic and yet, yet you need to be able to deconstruct. That is important. Oh, well, Kayuve, um, what about the military? What about uh, trying to find that balance? What about uh, all of these issues that Ranjana is raising? How do we move forward in that regard? Well, first of all, uh, space is inherently dual use from the very beginning. And uh, it, it was not by chance that, that we have the notion of peaceful uses and not of military uses. We have the notion of military uses in Article 4.2 when it comes to the moon and other celestial bodies. So uh, the, the drafters of the Outer Space Treaty and the subsequent treaties have uh, very clearly understood uh, that there is this difference between uh, peaceful uses and military uses. And that brings me immediately to the, to the key point. The key point is that we have to regulate the behavior in outer space. We don't regulate so far or so much the behavior in outer space. We have regulated by the treaties and through the treaties the status of outer space and the status of the space actors. But we are now only now starting to regulate the behavior in outer space. And this is basically space traffic management. But it is more when it comes to the military component and also the security approach. It is transparency and confidence building measures. You can also see STM as one big confidence and uh, transparency building measure just not call it like that but in essence it is uh, uh, TCDM and this is something we have to work on. We also should not be naive uh, to think uh, that if uh, the one or the other state government uh, wants to create uh, a conflict and wants uh, to do physical harm to others um, that we can, uh, through multilateralism or whatever, uh, prevention stop that. If we have TCBMs which work, we understand that and see that at an early stage and then can prepare ourselves, can act, react in an appropriate way without immediately going to a full-scale uh, military conflict. So the elements of uh, prevention, the elements of uh, regulating behavior in outer space will be key, absolutely key together with PCBMs for maintaining peaceful uh, uh, uses uh, of outer space. And this is something where we still have to work on and it will, and I'm pretty sure it might also come think of what Ranjana mentioned for the national level, and these are sanctions. Uh, on the national level, you can sanction um, uh, an, an actor which has license and does not comply with the, with, the, uh, uh, with, with the basics of this license. We have to come to a point in the future, but it's still quite a bit away, uh, to consider sanctions for those uh, who do not abide by the rules uh, in outer space. Thank God we, there is not yet a situation where, where even I would say now we sanction that, but it, we are getting closer and closer to it. Uh, and it also um, comprises issues of cybersecurity. It comprises issues which are below the physical interference, uh, in particular through jamming, spoofing, uh, and blinding, things like that. Uh, and and we, we really have to think of prevention on the one hand, behavior on the other hand, and a third hand, uh, possibly uh, to, to, to have sanctions uh, in the future 
uh, which will then bring those actors who uh, do not uh, respect the rule of law can be brought back uh, to to a situation which is beneficial for all. Yeah, I agree. We, we've got some fantastic questions, but before I just want to ask put one more piece in this puzzle, and that is, of course, space has become a much more of a commercial area as well. And so, you know, we know the numbers and the number of actors and the way that major companies all around the world are being involved in space as well as startups and smaller companies. I wonder, from the perspective, Ranjana, you talked about the, the private sector before, from the perspective of the commercial actors, they want stability in space. It's in their interest that space continues so they can generate the, the, the business through their operations or whatever. How can the commercial sector be utilized to help promote these fundamental principles and Kayuva, how can civil society be utilized to help drive as Ranjana, as you both said, this notion that that the voices have to direct the decision makers. Firstly, Ranjana, what is the impact of this commercialization on the way space operates? and the need to respect the fundamental principles. Look, as you said, you answered that question in a way to say that uh, commercial space also wants to maintain the status quo and not do anything that is going to destabilize. Now, if that be the case, first and foremost, it must learn to abide by the norms that have development, developed in actually operating in space. I was talking to some people over here who are knowledgeable of this subject. And I said, well, what happens? Because you hear of these close proximity and collision warnings, such likes. So what happens when there are these two satellites that you know one has to move? And I was told, and correct me if I'm wrong, because both of you have greater experience in these matters, is that the older system gets precedent and is allowed to move on, and the younger one undertakes that collision avoidance maneuver and in its time then gets that precedent. If that be the case, I'm wondering about a reported, uh, you know, again, not very long ago, where a young space company said, well, I'm sorry, I'm not moving out, you do what you want to the older one. Now, if there are norms, we need to identify the rules of conduct. It's a little bit like learning table manners, if you like, <laughs> of how you are to conduct yourself. When you're sitting at a table with so many people, then how are you to do that? And maybe this is the next set of norms. It's not just how you will use that space object, but it is also operational space traffic management. Without that, how will it be? That's the first thing. And since uh, you're talking about commercialization and rate of return and then all that, that commercial company also want, then I'm thinking, for example, of the principle pertaining to uh, satellites that are used for um, DTH, the UN uh, principle. And I just thought to myself that that space research is capable of directly being delivered to a national uh, you know, territory. Unlike the remote sensing, where the raw data that is collected is going to, is, uh, it needs to be provided at sort of uh, non discriminatory basis, even to the, uh, particularly to the countries which have been sensed. So that, in a sense, told me that, you know, of course, your space to earth economy is somewhat saturated. There's a little more that we can do. But we are now talking of beyond and you're talking of moon and asteroids and all such things, then there is that parallel where there is some raw product, that's a mine product, maybe that has to be converted, it has to be brought back, it has to be put on the international market. That's a long shot, unless there's going to be a whole uh, new world that comes up there, we won't be around to see it. So if that is the case, the way to go is to use all these concepts of rate of return, EBITDA, and all the rest of it, it can't be a cut and paste. We need to use the moon agreement 
It is the only one that has the principle set out and it is not dictating to you what to do. There is liberty given to the countries to decide how they would like to do it. We have to use mechanisms that have international sanction. UN sanction, you can't just... I mean, it's great to have new ideas. It's absolutely wonderful because it tells you how valuable what you have already is in comparison. Are you there? Uh, I mean, it, it, this is it's a tough, but firstly, the Moon Agreement, you know, India is in fact a signatory of the Moon Agreement. I've spoken with uh, with your government people at COPOS and, you know, it would be lovely if they move that to another level, we shall see. My country, Australia, of course, is a party and we love the Moon Agreement down here in Australia. So it's lovely that you refer to it. Kayuva, you are a, such a spokesperson for civil society and think tanks and of course the ISL, but many other areas. So if you were speaking to civil society and you want to help them really make a difference in, in returning to these fundamental precepts, what would you say to them? The, the first thing is uh, that, that I encourage civil society to be outspoken because civil society is strong and is getting stronger and stronger. Um, civil society uh, regarding space, let's say 20 or 30 years ago, was, was, was not really visible. There were experts, uh, of course, but civil society took not any note and any stand also. Now, we have seen so many successful campaigns, uh, not in space, but, but in other areas. I mentioned this, this fantastic uh, stop ecocide. Uh, I should also mention um, the Ottawa uh, process against landmines, which was also initiated by uh, civil society. So civil society can have an impact. It can have an impact when it comes to something concrete. Uh, it's, it's not peace, it's not development whatsoever. That's my experience. If there is a concrete case, if there is a concrete issue for a campaign, it can be fantastic. But if it's only we want to promote, it's uh, a nice to have and it's an important to have because the politicians will then say, okay, people uh, are fine if I vote for an increase in the space budget. But if we want to really engage the public and civil society, we have to have something concrete. Now, we had that. Uh, uh, the Canadians uh, put up this open letter against uh, the uh, against uh, ASA tests. I immediately signed that as, as one of the first also uh, in you, you as well, me in the capacity as former uh, uh, chair of legal subcommittee. So this is something which is very, very good. And I'm absolutely sure that uh, the US government uh, had a close look into that um, when drafting uh, their policy. So it has an impact. The question now is, what um, could we take as a, as a topic uh, for a, a campaign uh, by civil society? And there, uh, the issue of, of resource mining might be uh, a, a very good uh, a very good uh, theme to take up because it contains everything it contains peaceful uses no conflicts it contains the maintenance of the basic principles as non-appropriation but use fair use fair use discussed and arranged amongst legitimated actors and this is also uh, turning a little bit away from the uh, civil society, what I advise governments to do. I tell them, sign and ratify the Moon Agreement. And as soon as there is a critical number of signatories, maybe 30 or 40, you set up a state conference under Article 13 to create a regime. And this will then be the only legitimate format of resource mining or the use of resources 
uh, in outer space on the moon and celestial bodies. Because as Ramiana pointed out, the moon agreement is not an agreement to stop or hinder uh, or block resource mining, it is one to enable it. And when we turn it that way, supported also by, by, a, uh, by a campaign of civil society, I think we can uh, uh, take a few things together as peaceful uses, as commercial activities, but also as um, maintaining the character of outer space as a global common, as common heritage uh, of mankind. And, and that would be a fantastic case and a cause in order to maintain the rule of law in outer space. Now, thank you for raising that. And as you know, a lot of work is being done on the resources side. And of course, the Moon Agreement is an integral input to all of those discussions. Um, of course, time is flying by. I'll, I'll go to Torsten. Torsten, you're our reality check, as always. You've heard what everybody has to say, and I welcome your feedback. But also, we've got some great questions. So I'll, I'm in your hands. What would Give us some questions for uh, Kayuza and Ranjana to ponder and consider. I would start with the reality check first and then go to really this wonderful question. And thank, I'm very grateful for, uh, for all of those uh, from, from the audience. Um, when you spoke about global leadership, um, I just want to point to one the discussion I had or interview I, I could do are a few weeks back in, in Lausanne at the Kinetic uh, LEO or Space Safety Workshop or at the EPFL, where I had the chance to speak with Jim Bridenstein. And mm. we know his uh, uh, former position in, in NASA, where he comes from, and now he's a senior advisor at an investment company. So what is fine. So. When he was on stage and a few of us here in the audience are have been in, in Lausanne and followed the discussion. He was saying, yeah, we need global consensus. We need global uh, leadership in that. So and he took the example of the FAA in the US, then uh, bringing their rules into the ICAO. And now the entire world flies on literally flies uh, by the norms in or uh, on, on ICAO. So and then I talked with him in this interview, and or I put the link in or into the into or into the chat here in a minute, where he then said, "Yeah, also STM or the Artemis Accords are examples of how we want to move forward. So we are finding a global alliances, global partners, and moving ahead with that, because you running it by the UN is not an option because any new entity in the UN." will take 10 years, and it was his word, to, to found and coming up in a non-appropriate matter. So, and we don't have this time right now. So, and that was for me as a strong believer in, in global consensus, definitely not an answer I want to hear, but I, I understood the rationale. Mm -hmm. Coming now uh, to, the, uh, to the questions, and I will take the one, and I'm sorry if I misspelled your name, Chan Yali Gamad, with the Artemis Accords getting more signatories, how do you see extraction of resources on the moon not being violating the Article 2 of the Outer Space Treaty from a practical perspective? And I think that goes into your work, Stephen, and uh, in the work of, of all the others as well. Yeah, great question. Uh, Ranjana, would you like to re re reflect on that? <laughs> well, it's a very difficult question. It's a very pertinent question. How shall we ensure that uh, you know that the that the uh, there is no creeping acquisition by any other means? Call it uh, that if you like. What is the way to ensure? The way to ensure is, I believe, the Moon Agreement, a bilateral route which has all these elements, it has caused a lot of uh, countries to be disconcerted by civil society, by experts to be disconcerted. I understand that it might take 10 years, it might even take 12 years, or then again, it might take five years. It all depends on whether countries are willing 
to sit and talk. And the principal players must sit and talk if the project comes from them. How can you prejudge whether it will take long or not? That's unfair to everybody else. For sure, go through the Boone Agreement chapter and verse with an open, flexible mind, then say it doesn't work. We need something more, let's get a consensus on a new PT. Fair enough. But without giving it a try, without giving it a genuine try, how can you guarantee that? The question, the answer to it, can't guarantee anything. Uh, you, uh, Kovu, I've heard you speak a lot about the Artemis Accords and how it fits in with the, the principles of law. And the question says that there is this eventual clash between Artemis Accords activities and perhaps the non-appropriation principle. Do you think, I make the point, and on this issue, you know, I want to remain a little bit neutral given the work I'm doing at the UN, but a couple of countries already, Australia and Mexico, who are both parties to the Moon Agreement are also signatories to the Artemis Accords and have made statements to the effect that they're perfectly consistent. Uh, the question assumes they're not consistent and there's been a lot of scholarship to that effect. And without this turning into a legal a legal discussion of too, too much technical um, content, do you see that the Moon Agreement and the Artemis Accords and other civil society work can actually be reconciled to come up with some rules of the road, hopefully through our working group, but maybe not, that will make sense for everybody? Well, we, we don't have to, to uh, let's say, start the discussion on, on, on the character uh, and the substance of, 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 of the Artemis Accords. They, they are not uh, international law, even uh, if, if you would make a survey, uh, most people uh, you ask would say, oh, uh, they have the same status as the Outer Space Treaty or, or, the, uh, or the Moon Agreement. Yeah, you, are, you are laughing and you are shaking your head, but, but uh, try it. Um, you, will, you will hear the, the most strange things. Now, the uh, US government never made, uh, made uh, or, or tried to, to make people believe that they are uh, of the quality of an international uh, agreement. Uh, they always said this is a policy document. This this is something we bring forward, put forward, in order to to uh, 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 find allies in in the way we would regard that. Of course, uh, this now can be and has to be put into multilateral discussions. Here we are back uh, to to leadership. Uh, the U.S. Uh, provided leadership. Uh, in this respect. Uh, I myself also had my, my, my doubts about a few provisions. Uh, we can discuss that. And, and uh, if this is then uh, put into the multilateral context, uh, all the member states will decide on what to take, uh, what to leave for a kind of uh, international understanding, which, which might then turn out to be a uh, UN General Assembly resolution for that purpose. So uh, we, we don't have to dramatize uh, the, the conflict between Artemis Accords and, and international law, but we, we just have to take it as what it is, a, a very good uh, proposal with some points which uh, have to be either clarified or, 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 or then changed, um, but as something which is extremely useful also to implement obligations from international law. And this is its strength, uh, I would say. But now turning uh, to the issue of, uh, of, of, of the broader regime uh, for uh, resource mining, I, I, would, I would come from a different uh, perspective uh, than, than what we have discussed now and what, what has been discussed also for, 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 for ages now. Uh, my, my view is the first that um, it has everything has to be based on the experience we have on Earth. 
And we have to tell people what is happening on Earth when it comes to grabbing land, uh, grabbing uh, the, uh, uh, the, the woods, uh, the, the, the high seas, and, and all these things. When, when you allow everybody to either appropriate it or to use it as, as they want. It will be degraded, uh, spoiled, and it will be destroyed. And, and we have to simply acknowledge that. And we have to acknowledge uh, whether we, uh, or ask ourselves, whether we want that also in outer space. We have made rules for frequency uh, use and the use of the geostationary orbit. Uh, so it was no first come, first serve uh, anymore. It was regulated. And we have to do exactly the same uh, with, uh, with the resources. And we can do that. And we can do that in a way, as Article 44 of the Convention of, of the ITU uh, points out, in a way which is at the same time equitable, fair, uh, but also efficient. And this is something where, where, where I think uh, we, we also um, have to be a little bit more, let, let's say, social or philosophical uh, even. Uh, I, I, I pointed out to the inspirational force of, of uh, space law. We should never forget uh, that outer space is a global common. And uh, uh, even if um, the one or the other government uh, denies that, uh, uh, now with government change, uh, this is different again. But nevertheless, uh, this is the basic character. And, and this also means how we can handle and should handle issues like uh, uh, the resources. It's not first come, first serve. It's not that billionaires uh, uh, put the rules upon us that they can do uh, what they want uh, on Earth and uh, now in space. So we have to stand up against that and, and to create or maintain the rules and the principles which are there, which then can lead not to blocking everything, but to channel such developments in a way that it is fair and reasonable and avoids, I stress that again, avoids the uh, bad things that we are doing on Earth to the environment, to animals, uh, to so many uh, things uh, which which are simply destroyed through the concepts of neoliberalism and of property, you have to say. Thank, thank you, Kyrie. Thank you so much. Um, Torsten, do we have time for one more question? I mean, your Absolutely. hand. Absolutely. I mean, they are too good to not to ask. So, uh, yeah. Va Valentin came, came up with a very good question. So, um, and it turns a bit to the perspective. Lawyers, it's how <laughs> he starts. So. So it's not for me, it's for you. What do you expect from the space community to support your work in your committees and in your work with politicians? Data, solutions, standards, risk, proposals. So the wish list is on you now. Oh. <laughs> um, I could reflect on that uh, given uh, the particular work that I'm doing, but maybe uh, Ranjana or Kayuba, do you have some thoughts first on, you know, it, it's not, the work can't be done just by lawyers. We need to have everybody in the room. We need to get the information from everyone. How do you think that should happen, you know, in a practical sense? Because at the moment, decisions are made by relatively narrow groups of people. Um, so how do, we, how do we have a more widespread voice in terms of that decision making? Ranjana? Well, I think that the starting point would be uh, the small groups that are operating just now. And there would have to be a forum, maybe uh, you, Stephen, uh, you can host a lunch the next time, uh, where all these various groups come together, that there is some commonality that we're able to under identify across, so vertically. Seven groups are saying this is important, so let's say that that is important, you make out that list. And I think we have to scale it up to reach some uh, understanding of what are the issues, because it is everybody's view that must count. And everybody has to be asked. People don't want to be told anymore. They're fed up of all that, mm -hmm. even though they're not in a position perhaps to articulate that. 
So let us uh, start with that in these ways. Uh, Kaiwi is talking so much about civil society groups, NGOs, think tanks. And let's say that, all right, uh, you know, six months, one year from now, let these uh, send in their documents and there's some understanding of what are the common issues that across. Because like I said, we're not talking only of spacefaring nations. We're talking of the rest of the world that are not in that position. But what specifically, Ranjana, can the space community provide you on the law side in these committees to make a better job, to help you? I mean, that was really an offer to, to, to support your work. So what can yes. that be? Well, I will, you'll have to give me a little bit of time to think. And I'll be very happy to revert to you and to tell you, give you some thoughts that we have on the subject. That would be a wonderful opinion piece, what we would be glad to publish <laughs> at any given time. <laughs> Thank you. Kaiva, do you have yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, of course, it's the obligation of, of any lawyer to uh, base uh, her or his uh, uh, ideas on space law on facts, uh, figures, and uh, the substance of, of what we are talking about. So uh, the good thing is that, that we have the opportunity as space lawyers to interact uh, with the technical and scientific people in a very open and uh, um, unobstructed way. Uh, in particular at IACs, International Astronautical Congresses, where we as IISL have the uh, colloquium on space law, uh, where all our participants then also look into the technical sessions and the plenaries uh, and interact uh, with, the, with the technical people. So th this is uh, uh, certainly the basis also for uh, a good understanding and then uh, a, a reflected way of uh, coming up uh, with our uh, own ideas. And uh, to, to, to make it also uh, concrete, uh, it is certainly also uh, about uh, the question um, how we then handle uh, what uh, Valentin also put in uh, his uh, remark, what, how we handle risks. I, I see this as a, as a very good point where the scientists and the technology people can help the lawyers in um, making uh, or creating ideas uh, which, which we so far have not, uh, let's say, properly uh, uh, done. We are living, uh, you know, the sociologist uh, Ulrich Beck, I guess, uh, in a risk society on the national as well as on the international level, where the question is, how are the risks uh, distributed uh, amongst uh, the parts of society, also amongst the states? And in space, uh, we, we do not have a comprehensive approach on understanding risk. We have risk reports, for example, by the World Economic Forum and, and, and other institutions, where the, the risks of, of the next decade or the next year are uh, outlined sometimes 10, sometimes 20. We should have the same possibly for outer space, where then uh, the lawyers, as well as the policy people, can draw conclusions on how to handle these risks, which is rather neutral also, um, in a way that it is, uh, or the management of these risks is then translated into into law and regulation. Maybe that uh, you asked me for a concrete uh, uh, point, uh, looking at the, at the input of, of, of Valentin, that would be my, my first choice. Yeah, I think that's a really good um, notion. Valentin, let me just very quickly, because we're running out of time, also reflect on the, the example of the working group that I'm involved with on resources. So it's, as, as you heard from Kayuva and Ranjana, there's so many aspects. This is not just a question of law or policy or economics. It's a question of culture. It's a question of environment. It's a question of equity. It's a question of fairness. It's a question of sharing of benefits. It's a question of, should we be doing this at all? It, you know, there are many, 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 many questions. And yet, 
like it or not, we're caught within this intergovernmental process where in the end decisions are made by governments. But the way we have projected the work is we don't even know what the questions are yet, really. And so how can you come up with the answers? We need to get that information. We need to understand those different voices. And so even within this intergovernmental process, we're finding ways of allowing those other voices, you know, from the non-lawyers, but and 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 I mean the whole gamut of from engineering to industrial to civil society to cultural to environmentalist, to have those inputs. Of course, it still in the end is a going to be an intergovernmental decision. It, as Kaiva says, in the end, we need that multilateral process that's driven by government. But I think, unlike before, we're now at a time where everybody understands that space is complex. And, and there are so many people who, as Ranjana said, they don't want to be told anymore. They have a view and they're being encouraged to have those views. And I think more and more we'll see that, you know, and then we have to continue to ensure that the, the ultimate decision makers actually listen. And of course, that's tough. It's a change of thinking, it's a change of modus operandi, but, you know, with voices like Kaiuva and Ranjana um, propelling this, you know, we are moving in that direction, but we also have to move in that direction because it's, we have no choice. Um, Torsten, uh, I, I'll, I think we're completely out of time as always, but it's just been a wonderful discussion. Absolutely. So, you're, uh, you're so lucky that our production team is not in today so that I'm doing the production. <laughs> so otherwise he had cut off all, cut us off from I, the group. I would already. have been pulled off, pulled yeah. off the stage like that. That's right. Um let me but, let me just firstly um before I pass to you say to Ranjana and Kari about, you know, we could talk forever and, and just having the two of you there is so inspirational to use Kayuva's word. And you know enduring in the sense that we could just continue to hear your thoughts forever. Thank you so much. And I really, really hope that you both have enjoyed sharing your thoughts. I know everybody, there's a lot of people looking at this on LinkedIn as well. And, and, and I'm sure they've learned so much from your wise words. So thank you for giving us your time and joining us today in this wonderful picnic in India. Um, Ranjana, thanks for the invitation. So thank you, Kaiva. Thank you, Ranjana. Uh, Torsten, back to you. And I would like to offer, because these are questions which are couldn't be answered due to the short time that we just had for our, uh, for our breakfast, um, I would like to send to you, um, Stephen, and so maybe we can provide an, Absolutely. a written answer then in the, in the recap um, to all of you. Good. So, Chiara, I think it's it's your turn now. No, yes. it's not. It's not. It's, it's Stephen's Stephen, turn Stephen. for the next the Space Cafe Law Breakfast. Oh, you finish one, you already have to think about the next one. God, you know, life yeah. never stops. But I don't know how we can do better than we've done today, but they just keep on getting better and better. And we will be meeting again on the 28th of July. Um, note, it's going to be a slightly different time because we don't want Christopher Johnson, who's in the United States, to be um, awake at uh, two in the morning. It would be a bit uh, inhuman. So at 12.30 Central European summertime, and you can see the equivalents elsewhere, on the 28th we'll have Annie Hanmar, who's in the audience today. Hi, Annie, from Australia, and Chris Johnson from the United States. That will be a, just an incredible conversation as well. Please put it in your diaries if you're free. Come and join us. We will probably be having a cafe somewhere in the United States next time. So uh, we'll see. Yes, Annie, we're looking forward to hearing from you as well. Um, so please join us for our next Space Cafe, Space Law Breakfast on the 28th of July. Thanks, Kiara. And on the subject of upcoming events, I would love to give a brief rundown of our next events. So for next week, on the 24th of May, we'll have our 33 Minutes with Crystal Azelton from Secure World Foundation. 
And on the 27th of May, we'll have our next Space Cafe Brazil by Ian Grossner, live from the workshop on space resources in Brazil. And this will, of course, be in Portuguese. Then on the 31st of May, we'll have our 33 minutes with Adnan al Muhali of Turaya. And kicking it off on the 1st of June, we'll have our Space Cafe Italy by the wonderful Dr. Emagati, who will be talking to the CEO of Talis Alinea Space Italy in Italian. All our events are going to be online on Eventbrite as always. And as always, we love to hear your feedback. So please check in with us on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Don't forget to sign up for our daily and bi-weekly newsletters. And if you want to treat yourselves to something special, become a Space Watcher today or help us out in the supporter program. Thank you all so much for your interest today, for your active questions and participation. A huge thank you to Rayana and Kai Uwe for the inspiring and insightful chat and for being our guest today. Stephen, thank you. Have you been happy with the program today? Oh, it's, it's just been wonderful. And, and as I said, Ranjana and Kai Uwe are two of the most amazing people with, and, and if we listen to them, the world will be a much, 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 much better place. So, uh, so thank you again, and, and I wish you both well. And I wish everybody well. We will get to the questions, uh, Torsten, uh, and uh, I might ask Ranjana and Kayu if they've got any thoughts on some of those questions as well. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. And back to you, Kiara. Thank, thank you, Stephen, and bye-bye. Yes, and thanks to the entire team behind the scenes for doing this great job week in and week out. I hope that everyone stays safe and stays healthy. Thanks to everyone in the audience for joining us today. Hopefully see you in the next weeks. And in the meantime, don't forget to visit our website, follow us on social media, and don't forget, become a space watcher. Thank you.